Diablo's been at the back of my mind for the better part of two decades, and at the front for the rest. A friend got me the battle chest, and though I had Diablo 1's disc, Diablo 2 was like religion. Muted and dark, but stark and alive, blood demons and steel. Diablo was fascinating. When Diablo 3 came, I sunk my time in and left, but the echoes of discontent from friend, fan, and forum trash alike lingered. And for years I've meant to dig into it all, figure out what the hell happened to Diablo. Where did it come from? What is it, really, and why do people see it the way they do? So I'm critiquing the series, not screaming, not sermonizing, just analysis. God help me. While I won't belabor the very well-documented history of Diablo and its development, I'll touch on key moments when the time is right. The series' inception is often called the birth of the ARPG genre, but that's misleading. Other games were doing what Diablo set out to, and earlier, but Diablo redefined what action RPG meant. Not Zelda, not Secret of Mana, but an isometric real-time RPG with dungeons, loot, and minimal adventure. The developer described a moment where being forced to reprogram the thing away from its its turn-based roots on short notice, and being fairly unhappy about it, made his avatar slide across the floor, swing its sword, and shatter his skeleton. The game found direction in that moment, a game about killing monsters quickly, where each kill is as satisfying as that first pile of bones. Diablo began as a roguelike, but pivoted due to the developer, Condor Games, soon to become Blizzard North, and their interactions with Blizzard proper. Apparently its status as a roguelike is somewhat contentious with fans, but it doesn't matter. Diablo Diablo 1 didn't popularize the roguelike genre, but it did spawn several ARPG Diablo-likes after all, and it certainly doesn't seem like a true roguelike unless you're willing to stretch definitions, though it retains strands of that lineage. A hardcore mode for players looking for permanent character death, the ability to restart a playthrough, keeping character progression, randomly generated elements, but it's the focus on real-time action and the overwhelming fairness shown to prepared players that severs the cord linking Diablo to its inspiration inspirations, but let it get up and walk. I'll leave timestamps in the description, but I think this video is best sucked back in full. Now, let's go to hell. Diablo 1 is often and best described with its main town's music. Whatever you think about Diablo 2 or 3, if you haven't played the original, you owe yourself the run. It's surprisingly competent, slow as it can be, and still the uncontested king of atmosphere in the series. The game laid out the skeleton of the franchise, gothic architecture, helpless people, hordes of monsters, potions, portals, items, it's a game of incredible focus. One hero, one villain, and a whole lot of incidentals. It doesn't take a genius to look at the box art and know what's going on. Character select with the Hellfire expansion gave the player four options lifted from traditional Dungeons and Dragons. Warrior, Rogue, Sorcerer, and Monk. Entering the game drops you in front of a dying man, and your only recourse is to enter the town's spiritually compromised cathedral. Just one direction to go down to hell. It's a straightforward experience. Each floor is loaded with monsters lurking in dark corners, swarming just out of sight, and you'll have to click every last one to death. At least if you want to be fully prepared to kill the Lord of Hell. Characters level up, producing attribute points for distribution. Of course, no novice is going to know what to do, and like with Diablo 2, it's entirely possible to find yourself in an unwinnable game state and be forced to reset your progress. Thankfully, with the power of the internet, I learned that I needed a fairly high distribution of dexterity points to hit anything as a warrior. It's nice being able to kill. The game follows a simple pattern. Kill as much as you can, collect whatever you can hold, and head back to town whenever you're full of loot or close to death. And each visit via slow walk or town portal greets you with that glorious music. Slightly eerie, mostly friendly, Tristram is so memorable not only for the innumerable times you venture back, but for the feeling hammered into your mind as you play that Tristram is safe. And you know it's safe because you can throw extra gold and items on the floor and they just stay there. The town is full of broken, weary people, and you'll get to know them over the course of the game, but only if you choose to. Each character has unique dialogue for whatever you're doing, but it's entirely extraneous. At times, a specific character will have a specific hint about a quest, but you can usually guess who knows what without having to buckshot conversation. The key takeaway is there's some semblance of a story, although most of the tale is the action along the way, to be frank, and there are characters, but none of it really 
gets in your way. The closest thing to story shackling the player comes from a select few quests, but even then they're forgettable or intentional gating to introduce the next level. You could go through the entire game without any real notion of narrative. This issue stems from one of the lingering roguelike elements, randomness, in that quests appear in the game, but semi-randomly. A player may never encounter the famous Butcher or Skeleton King in a given playthrough because of the randomized quest tables. It's shocking, especially because these enemies are so fondly remembered. But what's so much more memorable than the Butcher, the Skeleton King, Locked Don, and whoever is the atmosphere? I recommend playing this game single player because multiplayer with voice chat would easily compromise the mood. It's just so dark, so limited, so oppressive. You know monsters are in the shadows, but you can't always tell how many. The environments are simple, but convey what they need to, crushing claustrophobia. The distorted and bizarre music flavors every second of the journey, and props to the composer because I remember these tracks more than any from Diablo 2 or 3. I remember late in the game getting a helmet that reduced vision just slightly, and genuinely considered whether I needed the upgrade or not. It boxes you in and terrifies you, and god forbid you open a door unprepared. Granted, the game is simple enough, it's aged considerably, if you want to be healthy and safe you can. None of it is truly scary. But it has a way of gnawing at your sense of security. What your character says entering the caves below the catacombs where lava flows encapsulates that dread. It's hot down here. It's small but feels tonally dissonant, brief and half-jokey but fearful of the inevitability of hell. More so than any of the other games, the graphics lend uncanniness to what should be comedy. Maybe it's hard to believe, but the upright standing Balrogs convey otherworldliness better than a fully 3D rendered mega demon ever could. While the game starts easy enough with only your fear holding you back, eventually Diablo 1 finds itself in the trench of RPG balance hell, where you're either too strong to be stopped or literally everything is stopping you in your tracks. It's a game about amassing stat points, so it's expected, but it rarely feels like skill has anything to do with your success. While you can kite a bit with some characters, being stuck with a warrior meant I was slaughtering anything at close range and getting strung around by anything else. A few times you'll have to come back to finish a challenge later, sometimes four or five floors down before you can return to finish a particularly challenging enemy. But the game won't punish you for it. Notably, the DLC was particularly annoying for the warrior, as the liches shooting fireballs moved just quickly enough that I'd have to corner them to get the crucial two to three solid hits in to put them down. It was a ton of running and clicking and slogging, and I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think Diablo 1 was worth it. The only other real skill, aside from hotkey use, is AI manipulation, like funneling enemies into a doorway and whacking anything that comes close. And eventually, the game takes away your ability to do this and subjects you, once again, to stat hell, where chaos knights are making you flinch with every hit and it only takes three or four of them to be lethal and goddamn, it's a struggle. But you do it because you want to kill Diablo and because maybe, maybe something will drop an item. Unlike later games, loot isn't incredibly plentiful, so you'll be spending more time killing than selling, but inventory space is at a premium, hence the ground storage from earlier. I had a moment that I think perfectly captures the success and failure of Diablo as a game. Here it is. I was blowing through the game with relative ease, killing everything I saw until I saw a door. I opened it up, whoops, it's the butcher, haha, <laughs> fresh meat joke, I'm dead. What the f*** was that? Why was he so strong? So I avoided the butcher's room, killed some more things, got an item drop. Oh, a ring? Haven't got any of those. Got it identified. Seems okay, but whoa, what? It's worth how much? Sold it, bought a bunch of high power gear that sent my stats into the stratosphere, okay, competitive with the butcher's stats, and murdered him into the ground. And the game was smooth sailing, except for approximately three little bumps after that. One moment of sheer luck, finding something worth way more gold than I should have had at that moment, was like setting off a pack of C4 under the floor where a third of Diablo's minions were standing. That's absurd. And it's painful to think that stuff like that can happen at random and while some other player might, for example, pick a sorcerer and find that the enemies on a given floor are literally impossible to kill with their particular build. It's wild. The other bosses in the game aren't much to talk about. With a warrior, it's always gonna come down to clicking fast, chugging fast, and pumping stats. There is absolutely a need for specific gear, namely magic resist gear, but it's pretty easy to get what you need by the time you get there. One blockage I hit involved a pack of ranged magic damage dealers, so I went to do the expansion content instead 
bed, the hive, and its adjoined areas, and actually found it easier to advance through swaths of spiders, the defiler, and the end boss, Nakrul, than getting to Diablo. In that regard, Hellfire makes the game a lot smoother. Without those additional floors and monsters to kill, Diablo would have been significantly harder. Hellfire was criticized accurately for not retaining the same gothic, uncanny horror atmosphere by using lots of green, weaker music, and alien insects. It's remarkably out of flavor, but the development went to another team and it was a rush job. In short, it's healthy for game flow, but mostly an unnecessary distraction from the main event. While the grind to Diablo is tough at times, the actual battle is simple. Lure out the enemies surrounding him, kill them off one by one, and fight him alone, like it was meant to be. Generous use of potions and town portals, which can keep a player afloat indefinitely so long as they mine their health bar and portal location make the fight trivial, and that's a real shame. Diablo's tough, but he's got an aversion to cheese, and it'd ruin the whole thing if it weren't so hard getting to him in the first place. Hard in the long and arduous way, mind you, very little about this game was mechanically challenging, though it certainly didn't help my growing potential for carpal tunnel acquisition. <laughs> Diablo 1 is a strong start for a new franchise, and it sold well, immediately greenlighting a sequel. It'd have to be bigger and better in every way, bigger environments, more stuff to do, a proper narrative, more character classes, more customization, something so big and fantastic it'd steep in the minds of its players for years to come. And it did. Though I have to wonder how much of that praise is earned and how much of the criticism leveled at the third is sensible in retrospect. Now we've set the base, and if you're sitting there thinking, K-Bash, this is boring, I promise I'm going somewhere. And with that... Diablo m 2. Diablo 2 had a rough development, a delayed launch, and allegedly enough back and forth between Blizzard North and their parent company over story elements and things that each team thought the other was screwing up the game. It was one of the most significant and successful releases in PC gaming history. It's worth critique for that reason, but also because Diablo 2 is the focal point of seemingly any critique leveled at Diablo 3. I don't want to poison the well, however, so let's just stick to the second game for now. Diablo 2 fans seem to be outnumbered these days by a wide margin, but the core fans are incredibly dedicated, and Diablo 2 still holds the crown of most critical success in the series. The game was a perfect storm of upgrades from the first game, at least on the surface, and those upgrades have carried it along for 20 years now. The differences start with character select, a full array of heroes to choose from with unique animations, and for the first time, uncommon classes. Necromancer, Sorceress, Paladin, Druid, Assassin, Amazon, and Barbarian. <laughs> They were cool. Cooler than cool. They were Blizzard characters. And they had backgrounds, actual Diablo lore to back them up, and a host of deadly and downright beautifully pixelated abilities. They were the soul of the game. Characters leveled up, accruing attribute points as before, and while poor attribute point allocation could again ruin a character, a lot of players appreciate the breadth of customization available. Not that there's too much choice in attribute variety for the strongest builds, but I'll bang this drum later on when it counts. Characters also had skill trees, where you could invest points to unlock stronger abilities, stronger versions of already acquired abilities, and points in the same skill trees would often compound each other. Again, it made for unique character builds, but it's also fairly obvious what you should do with a character. Nothing sucks worse than not being able to kill a boss because your build is trash, because you threw points everywhere, right? Though thankfully a respec option is available, albeit extremely restricted. Diablo 2 came fully loaded with cutscenes for a stronger visual narrative experience experience, they were interspersed between levels and while your character often had nothing to do with them, they gave a peek into the events occurring in the world, because Diablo 2 had a world. The world was huge, five distinct environments with massive explorable areas, NPCs with various functions and personalities, six quests per act, as they were called, enemies tailored to the regions, locales with history, and a lot of procedurally generated dungeons, many entirely unnecessary to complete. A lot of the world building is skippable or discoverable, leading to many players praising the story for not being shoved down your throat. Sure, fair enough. I mean, you didn't even have to finish each of the act's objectives, only a number were actually mandatory. It had tons of content, tons of items to hunt for and grind towards, secret cow levels, a cube that let you combine items and rework item bonuses, and all kinds of things. One of the strongest expansions ever made for a video game. It was a killer game for the price. The backdrop was perfect too. The player character's goal is to hunt down 
down the Dark Wanderer, the main character from the first game who now bears the soul of Diablo, forced eastward by the Lord of Terror's corruption, spreading evil and sanity and destruction in his wake. Diablo 2 eases the player in with a dark camp and a familiar sounding tune. The opening moments are likely intended to bring the player back to the dark place Diablo 1 was set in. A character gives you a quest, and you're off to the brooding, expansive wilderness. The game was tough at times. I died more on normal mode, of all things, than I ever did in Diablo 1. But again, difficulty in Diablo rarely comes down to individual skill compared to something like Ninja Gaiden or Street Fighter. That said, playing MOBAs and other games that teach the player kiting and positioning help immensely. Diablo is only truly difficult when your gear is bad, and because of the fundamental design of encounters. The player character moves at a blinding pace compared to the absolute crawl of Diablo 1. In return, most enemies zip around as well. However, unlike Diablo 1, the outdoors are mostly without choke points, and enemies are absolutely teeming from every corner of the map. Your only recourse is to wrangle the horde and hit them with wide-ranged attacks, guerrilla tactics, hunker down and beat them down, or run. And running is tough, you know, you move fast, but again, there are enemies everywhere, and you've only got so much stamina. Diablo 2 added a mostly unnecessary stamina bar that's offset by chugging a potion if you really need to. Run out and you'll be reduced to a crawl until you wait it out. It didn't need to exist and cause too many close calls along the way, to be honest. I get that the intention is to bog the player down enough that they have to actually fight, explore, and appreciate the levels, but frankly, the environments are boring and repetitive, and you kill so much in the first act, I think you may may indeed take a bigger chunk out of Hell's forces than the entirety of the first game. It'd be fine if environments were smaller, but they're all fairly large. Trying to find a new area amounts to hugging a wall and opening the map. It's not pretty. The indoor locations, from cathedrals to caves, all function like you'd expect, with high monster numbers, extremely cramped and dangerous. This game is not Diablo 3. Your character is merely your character. The necromancer has no dash, no teleport, no mobility. If you get surrounded with no mana, you're dead, at least early on. So the game's harder than the first, but it only feels like that because of swarming. So let's talk about atmosphere. The last game was king of atmosphere. Players talking about what they hate about Diablo 3 talk about atmosphere. So what's Diablo 2 got? A dark and spooky wilderness leading to a cathedral. Okay, good. A desert. Skip that one. A tiki jungle, like two lightness notches too dark. Okay, fair enough. The wasteland leading to hell. Good. And finally, the expansion zone. A wintry mountaintop. Huh. This game is an Indiana Jones movie. Egyptian temples, tiki jungles, man, but with pixelated monsters. They might have been scary once upon a time, but in no way convey horror or fear. There's no creeping dread, no looming evil when you're blazing through a cathedral at 90 miles an hour and the swarms of demons are having a spastic shit hemorrhage. Frankly, the fear in this game, the one that actively subverts the intended atmosphere, is panic. Panic controls everything. Panic that there's too many monsters. Panic when you open a door. Panic that your stamina bar is gonna run out and you'll have to chug a potion, but you didn't put it on your bar and you can't remember the hotkey to your inventory? Panic is the only kind of fear on the menu. Well, that and playing hardcore in the early 2000s on dial-up. Even the bosses, who have so much HP, need to be whittled away while you skirt about the room panicking at the thought of having to run back and waste more time. And panic isn't an awful emotion for a game like this, but when people talk about Diablo 2, they talk about brooding atmosphere and dread. And when I see this, and this, and fucking this, and think they abandoned any hope for recapturing Diablo 1's atmosphere in Act 1 of the game, I wonder genuinely where those claims come from. And yet I think it's worth discussing because it seems to me that most of the people who despise the third game are big online players and loved the social aspect, the ability to chat and trade and team up, the ability to PvP and compete on the ladder, and none of that stuff has anything to do with the atmosphere. Atmosphere is ruined in multiplayer by 
default. I've never heard of two people who could get into an online chat in Diablo and just appreciate the atmosphere of the game. It's goofs and gaffs with your friends, dude. To be fair, at the very least, Diablo 2 presents itself as this dark gothic fantasy thing, but intention does not necessarily equal reality. The online aspect of Diablo 2 made it a coming of age game for some. Many players' first big mature online experience replete with exploitation, griefing, hacking, the like. If you and your friends killed a boss, you'd have to run under the corpse and click as fast as possible to get anything. And this was at a time when players ran map hacks to avoid exploration and auto pickup mods to snipe loot. It's absurd to think that the bulk of the Diablo 2 online core player base gave any thought or care to Diablo 2's artistic qualities, its fundamental gameplay. What makes the thing tick? It was a fun game at a mature rating to play with friends for a long time. That's all it needed to be, and it's been truly fascinating watching the community turn on Blizzard for Diablo 3, but we'll go into that properly later. I think the critics of the game, who tend to be core online players, forget that many people did not have sufficient internet, or friends, or any wish to cooperate online and wanted to experience Diablo 2 by themselves. I certainly didn't get into many online games with friends back in the day because I was a casual and because I didn't have much time to play. The single player mode highlights the flaws I've already discussed, but the game gets you into a kind of flow. You go out, dungeon or wilderness, it doesn't matter. You use your abilities and get extremely satisfying death animations in return, and for as samey as the overworld can be, the dungeons are fairly varied. You chug potions just like before, you town portal just like before, but now there's more abilities to contend with, so the game sees more hotkey action than a Diablo 1 warrior, at least. And it's kind of horrifying in a way that isn't panic. The horror of realizing you're enjoying the experience. And worse, realizing why. Diablo 2 is perhaps the first example of weaponized dopamine in a video game. It's funny in retrospect that fans would react so poorly to the Diablo phone game when all the way back in 2000, Diablo 2 was doing the same thing most abusive phone games do now, just without the gotcha mechanics. The game is a masterclass in sound design, meaty spell sound effects, brutal death splatters and splorches, that little health potion bubble, the opening of a town portal so ingrained from overuse, those beautiful clangs elicited by rearranging equipment, this game sounds so good. Spells absolutely blaze out of your hands, sorceress lightning is still my favorite lightning effect in video games, and it feels like each one delivers from cast to impact to provide maximum satisfaction. Corpse explosion corpse explosion. So much red paints the ground when you've made a warband of fallen explode. So much goop slurps out of the stomach of these Mount Ariat demons. This game is a wonder to behold. Little shrines dot the land alongside chests and other interactable objects alongside the enemies. So there's almost always something to click, something to break, and when they're gone, it's only a few steps to find more. And did I mention? Oh no, I think I forgot. <laughs> This is what I meant by weaponized dopamine. Loot explodes out of enemies. Gold, jewels, weapons and armor, magical, unique, set piece, legendary, loot is ubiquitous and mostly useless. And that's the danger. Diablo 1 had nothing on this game for loot drops. You were lucky to get good stuff. Diablo 2 throws so much at you, it's like it was built from the ground up to be a multiplayer game, regardless of the atmospheric cost. Elsewise, all that trash is getting vendored, and that's fine. More gold to build up for repairs when you die or for gambling, which sucks, but hey, gambling. Oh shit, this really is sounding like a phone game. For what it's worth, the gambling almost never works out how you'd like, but early on it's decent. Gold is much better hoarded for repairs, town portal costs, and yes, health and mana potions you'll be sucking back in a quantity fit to rival the ocean. It's not a terrible gold sink. Gold was pretty bad online because the Stone of Jordan and hacking made the economy horrible. I guess my main trouble with Diablo 2's design is the extreme swinginess of the entire construct. It's either I'm surrounded and terrified and underprepared and going to die, or lol JK, I'm a f***ing god, piss off demons. It's either I'm wandering in the wilderness for 10 minutes without finding anything, or oh yeah, I went exactly where I needed to in five seconds. It's either I found no gear for three acts to upgrade any of my stuff, or yeah, I got consistent helpful upgrades along the way. And you're either dead in a few hits or outlasting the Lord of Terror himself, all because of a few glass bottles and some paper. So Diablo needs its endgame, its nightmare and hell difficulty 
these to matter, to keep players going, elsewise everyone would have quit after the first run. And what better companions to keep you adventuring than your online friends, artificially raising the difficulty while effectively lowering it. Most players probably found meaning in joining each other's quests, getting stronger, and starting over when they wanted a new character with more awesome skills. The game isn't bad, but it requires the online component to be even half as compelling as people remember it being. Without it, the extra difficulties are meaningless. Meaningless because collecting some JPEGs with higher numbers isn't, I don't know, my version of living my best life. That's all. Now the expansion, as I've said, was probably the best thing that Blizzard ever did for this series. A full and fairly lengthy act, new enemies, two new playable classes, new gear, it was everything it needed to be and more. Mount Ariat's wilderness is claustrophobic with battlements and swarming demons more intricate than the others, and it generates a feeling of tension, a final battle on top of the world. Diablo 2 did a few things well for atmosphere, tone and mood that I can't reduce to multiplayer ruined it. The mood here is more epic than dreadful, however. Much more lighted areas, fairly epic designs like something out of Lord of the Rings. Diablo had the potential to be more than a brooding, melancholic, dark fantasy, and I think this partly inspired what happened with Diablo 3. As a final anecdote, my battle with Bale sucked. The final primeval, none of whom I've mentioned because stories of secondary importance to these games, is exceedingly difficult for a quickly run, unoptimized necromancer with tons of points in corpse explosion and nothing to use as a bomb. Not even potions and portals could save me. I tried a few times before aborting the entire build, reassigning everything into bone spells and notably bone spear, and annihilated the Lord of Destruction in a blink. It feels kind of cheap in a way. Fans constantly talk about player choice and how important it is to Diablo 2, but I think failure is the only choice for any non-expert, barring good luck or reading a guide. Choice indeed. I think, at the end, that Diablo 2 is a hard upgrade to Diablo 1 in every regard except for atmosphere, the much lauded strength of the early installments. Diablo 2 is the epitome of a game with a little something for everyone. It's got online play, it's got a decent single player mode, it's beautiful at times, it's tons to do, and anyone can just jump in and go. That's a good place to be. Diablo 2 was fun mostly the entire way through, but it was an exhausting kind of fun, the kind that pumped so much dopamine into my brain that I think I may have burnt out in the final moments. But it's worth playing, and it's worth looking at today, especially in light of the next game. Diablo 3 was initially started by Blizzard North before being cancelled, and while core fans lament the future that never was, maybe it's for the best. Diablo 3, as it ended up, is a smash hit, regardless of whether you like it or not, and Blizzard is paying attention. The entire aesthetic of early Diablo 4 reeks of dark fantasy, something players felt like they lost with the third installment. Maybe if we got the game that Blizzard North wanted to make, and it's just a speculative possibility, the series might have suffered a quiet death instead of the loud, angry life it's lived. So Diablo 3 was released 12 years after the second game. I remember obsessively checking the webpage for updates, sucking up every last piece of info that cropped up. It's embarrassing in retrospect, Diablo 3 was so far removed from its predecessor, with development being taken over by Blizzard proper, that it could never realistically live up to fan expectations. I played the vanilla release from normal mode to Inferno 1 Act 2 and quit, never to properly return until now. The game was fun for a while but turned into a slog, and Blizzard screwed a fair few things up. It seems like it took them till 2014 with the Reaper of Souls expansion pack to start bringing positive change to the game, and it was poisoned long before then. Diablo 3 has some core issues, but it's been fashioned into an extremely fun game to just pick up and play, and the sales back it up. Diablo 3 is a quality experience, and if I'm being perfectly honest, the amount of pure dripping vitriol for this game, sloshing from the mouths of core Diablo 2 fans, makes me want to defend it, warts and all, because most of it comes off as berserker fury lunacy without direction, even to the point of fabrication, deliberate misremembrance at times. So let's talk about what Diablo 3 was, and is, both vanilla and post-expansion, and how Diablo 3 detractors see the situation. 
Vanilla was a rapid fire grind of the highest difficulty for no other reason than to expel the pent up hype from the long wait to the game's release. Normal to nightmare to hell, the game was easy. It seemed like you only needed the strongest available weapon and you could brute force your way through the entire game. Very different from the predecessor, but not necessarily evil. No point in difficulty modes if you don't play them. Diablo 3 has a strongly integrated story, starting from the very moment you enter the game. Drawing a line in the sand to separate itself from its predecessors. Diablo 1 was about killing Diablo. Diablo 2 is about stopping the rise of the prime evils with some detours along the way. Diablo 3 is a carnival thrill ride through the world rife with characters, events, a narrative that won't even let you breathe for yourself unless you plan to do extraneous killing, and there's no real incentive to do that, but every step is planned to help you destroy Diablo and quell the various other evils in the land, even when it takes you to places that aren't directly relevant. Diablo 3's gameplay was then and is now a lot more involved than the previous games, which might seem strange to say if you've ever watched gameplay of Diablo 3, players zooming through zones like it's NASCAR, but that's all part of the design. Characters had more buttons, up to six core abilities placed on a bar that unlocked as you leveled up. Some abilities charged bars up, some dumped that bar for extra damage, some crowd controlled, some gave you mobility, defensive capabilities, there was a big cooldown ability for every character, etc. You could even alter your character with runes that unlocked new permutations of your core abilities, so every level you were gaining something. The characters of Diablo 3 are designed to function in intricate ways akin to MOBA characters but with the ability to handle anything single-handedly. More critique on this later. Diablo 3's enemies bespoke more intentional design than the past games, whose enemies mostly barreled towards the player or cast spells at range. That never changed, but more elite enemies with more bizarre abilities exist, like mortar blasting enemies and arcane laser enemies that ask the player to be dexterous and reactive more than past games. Acts ended with gigantic bosses that again bespoke intentional design. A player would need to get off the fire in the butcher's boss room or take massive damage. You could dodge certain powerful abilities with your mobility spell, whatever that was. There was counterplay. 12 years of game design consideration backing up what appears in the game. Diablo 3 did away with potions and portal scrolls. They were dumb and bad. Let's be real. Stocking hordes of consumables and rapidly downing them probably means enemies just need to do less damage. The loss of an instant portal is great. At least for people who think Diablo is too easy. God, what a loss. Not being able to warp back to safety with a button press in the middle of a battle with the actual Lord of Terror. God, Diablo's appealing so hard to the casuals. Ugh. Also, to me, it's just insane how many people are mad about the loss of attribute points. Like I've mentioned, people tended to look up builds anyway, so choice barely actually affected your build, and only the few specialists who wanted to try a weird build would play around with it. And while customization is neat and all, don't you think it's better if your character just works always? It's such a minor point, but people continue to screech about it. It's ridiculous. I'm not sorry that I like my characters to function. At face value, these changes are fine, and even admirable. However, the game had some glaring obnoxious issues in the vanilla edition, things like not being able to trade in multiplayer, which still hasn't been rectified, a real money auction house. Yuck. The kind of issues that diminish player interaction. But this isn't a review of the online scene, and those things didn't bother me too much. The auction house died later on, PvP, which was promised during development, never manifested, and all that was left was an exceedingly difficult grind into the Inferno difficulty, which gated most players at the second act permanently. It was a fun ride that became tedious and led to a dead stop. Now let's dig into vanilla Diablo 3. This game was, by all accounts, Modern Blizzard. It looked nothing like the Diablo of yore, and immediately got flack for everything it was doing in both design and narrative. The common reference point is World of Warcraft, World of Diablo Craft, and it's not hard to see why fans would make that claim. In past games, the premise is that the player is a wandering, insert class here, for the most part a nobody who stands up to Diablo. Diablo 3 makes you the chosen one, the Nephilim, the most powerful being on the planet, capable of shutting down angels and demons single-handed 
handedly, regardless of your background, and it all gets pretty silly. The mood shifts irreparably from brooding and dark in the minorest of senses to epic, full stop. You travel through scary dark place once, but then find out you're the Nephilim and it's off to the desert, to snowy war zone, to literally heaven, and the entirety of the story is building up the player to be the one person capable of making everything right. It's a stark contrast to what came before. The stakes of the plot were never higher, but infinitely hollower. The issue with calling the Nephilim concept bad and stupid, as many have, however, is that it's the most thematically appropriate thing Blizzard could do with Diablo as a game. There is no dark fantasy, except maybe Berserk, where the main character gets to mow down Hordes of Hell's minions so cleanly, so easily, and with such overwhelming power. At least in Berserk, fate is against the protagonist. Here you're fated to destroy Diablo, and every demon under his command, so why not make the player the chosen one. It's the same as Diablo 2, it's just being honest about itself. Diablo 2 had you doing the exact same thing, minus the hokey Nephilim thing, but you were still an unstoppable god, realistically speaking. It's not to say that the series is better off for the change, but that they were clearly driven by a wish to have story and gameplay unified. I guess you could say they wanted to avoid ludonarrative dissonance, but people want dissonance, I guess, or to cling to a false memory of something that never existed in the first place. Another thing players hated was the constant callback nonsense to Diablo 1. Names like Lockdanen, The Butcher, The Skeleton King, and Lazarus. I had never played Diablo 1 until this year. None of the nostalgia, save Deckard Cain and New Tristram, was even remotely nostalgic to me because the games came out 15 years apart from one another. That's a bit of a gap, you know? They probably wanted to let the player base know that Diablo 3 was a new creative step for the series, but that it was still Diablo regardless, but players thought the callbacks were forced and unnecessary, and I can't blame them for that. Resting on your laurels with nudges and nods is cute, but ineffective if the player base doesn't know the references, and it assumes those things were important were worth reiterating in the first place. I honestly wonder what we could have got instead if the game wasn't so keen on reiteration of past ideas. And reiterating them badly, mind you, the original Butcher is scary because you'll be too weak to fight him and die the first time you meet him. Now he's just a fat f***ing himbo. Like, you know someone's jerking off to that. I checked. And he's not scary like he was. He's just an interactive boss fight. The Skeleton King, same deal, except he's pathetically easy to kill. And he gets all this buildup in the level before the fight, but it doesn't pay off. He's hardly even relevant. He's just an irritating memory. If you're willing to look at the game as a fun ride, which I think is the intention, it's fine. The nostalgic context makes it extraneous. To ease off a bit, there's one complaint I can't jive with, and it's probably the thing that even started this video. It's people comparing Diablo 3's skill system to World of Warcraft. It's wow because you don't put points in, you just select what ability you want. Ugh, Blizzard gave me skills. Let me choose, Blizzard. What do you people even want? It's not like Diablo 2 lets you select the Necromancer's Poison Nova out of the gate either. Abilities in Diablo 3 are unlocked by leveling up, so you need a maxed out character to have all options available, but that's not remarkably hard to do. People didn't like that Blizzard prescribed you your bar, you know? That Blizzard dared to suggest that you utilize a cheap efficient spell, a costly damaging one, a mobility spell, the like. I don't understand it. People have literally written that Diablo Diablo 3 is a brainless game for unskilled casuals, and partially because Blizzard doesn't make you commit to a build path. How high on your own ass fumes do you have to be to say something like that? Even the strongest builds in Diablo 2? You're lucky if whatever character you're playing has more than three active skills at all. Usually only one major skill carries the entire build, and others are incidental. On that note, D2 builds that do require switching were only complicated because there wasn't a dead dedicated bar, and you'd have to swap around with a high key to use the ability, which is just straight up poor design. Diablo 3 requires that you use all of your buttons effectively, especially at the higher difficulties. And even when you aren't, you probably should be to optimize your clear times, your damage output, etc. No character gets out scot-free for spamming one move. People still whinge that Blizzard needs to axe the casual crap, as though looking up a cookie-cutter Diablo 2 build isn't the very 
definition. Suffering in Diablo 2 at a young age because your build sucked and you couldn't win doesn't make Diablo 2 a better game or you a smarter player. This line that I've seen regurgitated by sycophantic fabricators is the lifeblood of the toxicity surrounding both games. And it's just false at the outset. Gear is the major thing that carried any given build at the highest level, ultimately, and I think that's a problem. Allegedly, the grind to get the best gear in Diablo 3 is unbearably long and repetitive, though I'm not really sure what people expect from Blizzard. If acquiring the best loot is easy enough that a person with a full-time job can do it playing occasionally during the week, Blizzard gets derided for appealing to casuals, as though gaming addiction is something to be proud of. Making the grind long only gives longevity to the end game, and that's great for said gaming addicts. If it's bad because there's too much chance involved, you're playing the wrong game, I think. Diablo has been an insufferable grind to the heights of power since the second installment, charms and all. I can't think of a more flaccid critique, a half realization of what the game is, but not enough self-awareness to understand why it's flawed at the core for anyone who doesn't want to be jacked around by a video game. Not enough self-awareness to abandon hope in the format. But Diablo 3 has enough consistent, deliberate, enjoyable, meaty, flashy, and interesting class fantasy-minded design that any complaint about Diablo 3's characters falls flat for anyone not blinded by nostalgia. Now you can argue that Diablo 2 was better because it was a system of limitations, I guess. Characters with no get off me button would die when surrounded, and that was fun sometimes in the panicky way. It would naturally incentivize players to work together, especially if a player couldn't handle something alone. And there's something to be said for that, surely. But again, I like playing alone and being able to exercise a wide range of options while feeling like I'm playing a viable character is important to me. You wouldn't want to train up a character, get good, then find out your character is completely unviable because they don't have X or Y tool to compete with the rest. And Diablo 3 avoids that better than Diablo 2. I'm of the mind that when you die, it should be because you made a bad mistake, not because you made a little imperceptible mistake. I guess the summation of the issues with vanilla Diablo 3 and the core of the game itself is that regardless of developer intention, regardless of solid gameplay and deliberate design, the game is ultimately a controlled tour through Diablo land. You'll be handed your spells over time and Blizzard controls when and what you get. You can experience the story at your own pace, but only in as much as you're skipping or sitting through each cutscene. You meet the same people, hear the same lines, do the same things. It's not an adventure, it's a tour. And I'm okay with that, but it only lasts for the first run. Every second after has to be carried by pure gameplay, the core abilities your character has, and you'll have to find your favorite to make that work. Of course, Blizzard tried to fix that issue, somewhat. Games as a service, seasonal play, multiple avenues of progression, easily gained and incredibly powerful rewards, Diablo 2 is probably still something I enjoy more than the sequel because it's more interested in just being a game, not some money and time sink. I mean, you've heard everything up until this point. I'm relative on which is best because it doesn't really matter. Both have solid qualities, but 2 is deified and I think that's silly. 3 struggles to find integrity in its very makeup, however. Diablo 3's expansion tried to recapture a bit of fan approval by featuring an interesting, if confusing, new antagonist, a fairly gloomy, atmospheric locale, a new character, and all the fun bits I headed this section up with. The expansion was followed up by about 20 billion patches and the Necromancer DLC because, seriously Blizzard, why wasn't this part of Reaper of Souls? And we're finally at the present day. Events, adventure mode, Nephilim rifts, and all. And what a game it is. I'm not sure where to start. It's like D3 just poured its entire backpack out on my table. Let's talk Adventure Mode, a new game mode for people who are completely sick of Diablo 3's story can embark on a series of vaguely related quests, extremely reminiscent of World of Warcraft's world quests, complete a given area by doing four, earn a chest with like straight up legendaries in it, and move on. It's fun, it's easy, I just enjoyed my time playing a new character in Adventure Mode because it's like candy, it whisks you around to new areas and it's always over before it gets really boring. It seems like a direct answer to complaints about vanilla's narrative and a reprieve for longtime players. Nephilim Rifts and Greater Rifts provide instant access to randomly generated adventures for a small time investment, and a fairly strong return in loot and crafting materials. They provide theoretically endless gameplay, but the concept itself gets old quickly. You're either addicted enough to continue grinding or self-aware enough to shut it down, more or less. Lots of interesting updates to the game stem from this system, and they're worth experimenting with, at least. Seasons exist now, and I don't care for it, but here 
we are. Games as a service. What a phrase. I always feel like it cheapens the game. Like the game can't just be itself because Blizzard needs you to continue playing their game, getting swept up in the Blizzard brand, buying the special editions of their other games to get miniature pets in Diablo 3. What? I don't care for it. Completing seasonal goals on your temporary seasonal character, if you choose to engage in that kind of thing, will give you an upgrade so strong I can't believe it, and I don't understand it, but it make the flashy light big and brain-like. The Darkening of Tristram, the retro-style once-in-a-year event, where players go through a Diablo 3 version of Diablo 1. I'm not sure what to think about it. My immediate thought is, wow, this is pretty, and this is cute, but this game is Diablo 3, and none of this fits. Diablo 3 is a game about dopamine and a game about speed. Tacking Diablo 1 onto Diablo 3 makes Diablo 1 look like trash. While it's fun to revisit things once a year for some reason, I don't understand what they're doing here with this add-on. Nostalgia is fine, but acknowledging nostalgia with a game that lacks integrity in the fullest is only depressing, and it confuses me. Let's move on. I just started this section and I've got to say, I don't like this. Like the point of this video was to look at what Diablo is and was, right? See where it ended up. I don't like the anti-D3 discourse that aggrandizes Diablo 2 beyond belief, a game with actual flaws that constantly get glossed, but 1 and 2 both have their integrity. Diablo 3 is a game that's enjoyable until the lights stop dazzling. That's my problem. You can add every bit and bob, every game mode, every event and enjoyable thing but it wears on you, man. It's not a consistent gameplay experience, it's a light show. I said Diablo 2 weaponized dopamine. Diablo 3 drops nuclear grade dopamine bombs and drops them about every 30 seconds. Spell effects are fast, brutal, and flashy, even when they're not as beautiful as the second game. Enemies burn up in fire, melt in acid, die the most painful deaths, and fly away from the force of your blows. The landscape crumbles beneath your power. That is that a combo meter for killing monsters stringing me along to the next fight? Is that a combo meter for breaking objects? Gold and loot explodes from every chest. Every boss like Hell. mothering pinatas. Shrines dot the landscape, handing out experience buffs and more. It's no different than the second game, but good lord it's more plentiful and shinier by a mile. And then there's that bastard. There is no dark fantasy game with a f***ing loot goblin. Are you kidding me? That's the thing. This is my issue. Diablo 3 is a dopamine abusing power trip crafted by the developers to suck players into playing indefinitely and keep them hypnotized until the game burns up in its own searing blaze of light. It's insulting design at the core, and that's where I respect the Diablo 2 fans who want the atmosphere back. I don't even think it's the atmosphere that's the issue. Not really. I think they just want their game back. The one that doesn't seek to control. The one that doesn't seek to overpower. At the end of it, it's no wonder, sadly, that Blizzard was surprised by the backlash to Diablo Immortal. Diablo 3, Diablo Now, the one that 20 million players bought into, has the sneaking coercive design of a phone game. But the fanbase clearly sees it as more than that. They see it as a bastion of old Blizzard. And the core D1 and 2 fans, the ones who still angrily post in forums about the failings of Diablo 3, have a right to do so when the IP they loved viscerally is upgraded with clearly strong design, but clearly abusive intentions, and while I love the character design in the third, and find it fun to play more than any other, it's hard to beat a game whose integrity shines through in everything. Flaws and all. It's hard to criticize something so single-minded, so absolute in its purpose that it spawned a series named after its player's singular goal. For the first time in my meager online career, I can't choose a singular best game in the franchise. Or even worst game. Ordering them is nearly impossible because their strengths and weaknesses are so disparate. Play Diablo 1 if you want a classic atmospheric dungeon crawl. Play Diablo 2 if you want a turbocharged version of the first game in classic Blizzard design. Play Diablo 3 if you're into strong character builds, a long-lasting game, huge collectible opportunities, and dopamine in spades. Pray that Diablo 4 sets the series on the path to hell again.